All right, you are recording now. All right, sounds good. Um, hi, everybody. Um, welcome to um, the third episode of our Patents and the Public Interest um, speaker series. Um, again, my name is Charles Duan. I am a fellow um, with the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property at um, American University Washington College of Law. And I'm delighted to be joined my, by my good friend and colleague, Joe Mullen. Um, Joe is over at the, um, the Electronic Frontation, Frontier Foundation, or EFF, um, where he has the most amazing job title. Um, he is the Mark Cuban Chair to Eliminate Stupid Patents. Um, he was previously a reporter at Ars Technica um, where he covered patent issues and um, had a number of really, really influential articles. So um, welcome, Joe. It's great to have you here. Hi. Thank you for having me. So um, so as, as with all of our previous series, um, you know, our goal will be to talk you know, a little bit about what the issues are that you're looking at in terms of patent law and um, how those intersect with the public interest and with the interests of the organization that you work at, but also to talk a little bit about your career and how you kind of got into this um, fairly interesting space. And Joe, you've got a really interesting background because you're not a lawyer um, and you came in from a, from a journalism background. So you know, I guess to start off, can you tell kind of the story of um kind of how you how you got involved with patents in the first place yeah um so yeah my path was journalism i've just always been interested in writing and publishing and once i you know i had creative stories when i was a kid and then once i got into high school and college i realized oh you can kind of there's a job where you can go out talk to people and write publish the most interesting stuff that you find out that seemed really cool to me sent me off down the journalism path my first jobs were in the mainstream press. I covered um, a session of the Nevada State Legislature for the AP. I worked as an intern for the Seattle Times, um, went to journalism school at Berkeley. Uh, and then after that, I took this job covering courts in San Francisco, wanted to move back to San Francisco where a lot of my friends from college still were. Um, and I also thought it would be interesting to cover courts for a while. I had covered the legislature and I'd done a little coverage of the executive branch of government, you know, at, at state level. Um, and I thought, well, you know, courts are something I haven't really covered. And so I'll check this out. Well, I, I kind of came and I never left in one regard. Um, I got a job at uh, the Daily Journal, which was one legal newspaper. I pretty quickly moved over to American Lawyer Media. And I, I fell into, they hired me to cover IP litigation. At that time, the kind of big case and the one I had heard of just as a non-lawyer was probably Viacom versus YouTube was the only thing on that beat that I really had a sense of what it was about. And I knew that that was a high stakes case and was interesting. So I covered that. And I just, I think I got into covering IP at a really a transformative time, both for what was going on legally with IP and then also what was going on in the media industry um, in certain ways. And so um, I didn't go in thinking I would cover patents or write about patents or learn about patents. I, on day one of my job at the Daily Journal, I was handed a, a piece of an article from the San Francisco Chronicle, an old article that my editor had kept and Xerox to give to new people who were going to cover the IPB. It was about the difference between a copyright, a trademark, and a patent. And I will tell you, it was all news to me. I did not know. And this, this was like a brief. This was like five paragraphs long um, in the paper. And uh, I didn't really realize at, at that time, but I soon found out that um, covering patents would actually be the really hot space where I could make a, make a mark and do some original coverage. And it ended up just being a lot more interesting than I thought it would be. And um, my patent coverage is kind of what got me my next job. And in a, in a big way, I think covering patents, copyrights, and use and abuse of the IP litigation system is then what helped me transition into tech journalism which for certain, for certain reasons, I sort of liked better than the legal press. Um, but yeah, that's basically what led me to, you know, 10, 10 plus years of covering um, IP generally um, for, for a lay audience. And um, 
Then I transitioned to EFF in, in 2018, much more recently. Uh, yeah, so while you were over at ours, you, you published some, some really big stories. You want to you wanna tell us about some of them? Yeah, sure. So I, I joined ours in 2012. And to give you kind of some of the background, I mean, I didn't really know. So I say I didn't know what a patent was. You know, I, people have heard the phrase, I'm sure in this group, patent troll. When I first got a tip, this is probably the first week of my job at the Daily Journal. I will get to how I, what I did at ours in a second, but it's, it's relevant to know that when I was at the Daily Journal, the first tip I got about a patent troll story, I blew off completely. I thought this lawyer was like, just wanted to call his opponent names or something. And um, he wasn't actually directly involved in the litigation. But he said, I got a story for you about a patent troll. And I was like, what? I talked to the guy for a while and I was like, okay, you know, I basically blew him off. And um, I learned then from the guy who had covered the beat before me how patent trolls and litigation that was going on, particularly at that time in the Eastern District of Texas, had become this very hot, very controversial issue within the legal industry. And that that's what my readers really wanted to hear about. Anyone who could dig into that could get a real, real hit of a story. Um, I actually ended up calling that guy back and apologizing to him. He became a pretty decent source of mine. I said, I totally blew this. I'm interested in this story. Can we do a reset? Um, and he did. He was, he was gracious to me. Um, so I covered um, some of the more controversial sort of patent troll stories um, when I was in the legal press. And I was able to transition to ours because there was a massive appetite for those types of stories at ours. And let me give you an idea of the typical Ars Technica reader. Ars Technica is, you know, was, um, it's more than 20 years old now. It was a kind of an early website that was really hardcore technologists. So it's like people who read Wired every month and then they're like, well, that was really kind of like simplistic. I really want to dig in more. So as opposed to say like Wired, by the way, they're owned by the same company now, they're both owned by Condé Nast. Um, Wired is gonna be someone who's a technology enthusiast and is definitely interested in what's going on in technology. The Ars Technica reader is much more likely to be someone who works with technology every day, not necessarily computer technology. There's plenty of people working in medical health sciences, et cetera. But um, you know, typical reader is like often highly educated and um, just really interested in technology and, and everything about how it works and the legal disputes around it. Um, so uh, yeah, Ed, Edward Snowden actually was a reader of Ars Technica for many years and posted in our forums, which was something that came out after he became a, a whistleblower. But um, so the, the, the Ars Technica, one of the things that happened at it's, it's even, it's very early stages. I think one of the real, um, the, the business innovations that it brought was, it was covering things in the early aughts, newspapers were losing readers, especially they could not hook young new readers. And they were kind of like shrugging their shoulders and wondering why. So meanwhile, there were these huge phenomenons, like for example, the RIAA suing on Moss college students thousands and thousands of college students, which EFF also wrote about, right? As a, as a younger reporter, I learned about that by reading EFF's reports about it. And I thought, wow, you know, this is actually unprecedented in the history of the American legal system that the entertainment industry would make a massive, you know, $100 million plus project of suing its own customers um, in order to kind of make a point and try to alter the law in a way that was in its favor. Um, and Ars Technica would just cover that uh, incessantly. I mean, they were willing to cover every filing and the appetite for it was gigantic. So when I came on board in 2012, they just kind of couldn't get enough of that. I was able to, they had a history of covering what I would say are like abuses of copyright litigation or certainly uses of the system that many people working in technology felt were abusive. And I was able to expand that into patents pretty quickly. So like a couple of the links that I sent you, Charles, were to stories from early 2013. So that was like only about six months into my time at Ars Technica. I wrote a story about how Newegg 
beat the um, shopping cart patent, which was this patent that had basically been used to hold up the entire online retail industry. And that's where I really took off because Newegg, I let Newegg, who at that time had Lee Chang as, his, as its uh, top lawyer, he, he was always good for a quote. He was one of these corporate lawyers who had a lot of freedom to kind of say, you know, the, I think the pull quote in there was like, we looked at this and we said, this is bullshit, right? And he kind of became a hero to our Technica readers, I think, for, for years after that story was published. That story went absolutely nuclear viral. It's got over a million reads. Um, was one of the top 50 stories um, at Ars Technica of all time in terms of readership, the only patent story on that list. And it was because people were ready for, people wanted to read a story about someone who's going to fight back, I think. That's what they really wanted to hear. And they wanted to, they knew patent trolling and patent abuses were a problem. They wanted to hear a story about someone who would really fight back. And in this case, won, right? So that was a very appealing story. And that's when we realized that um, there was that there was this going to be this ability to tap into this um, this line of storytelling that was going to appeal to a lot of readers and that people wanted to learn more about because it was affecting their lives, right? So there was no technology company out there that wasn't once you got to a certain size, you became aware of the patent trolling threats. And this was about the peak of patent trolling in some ways, like 2011, 2012, 2013, certainly the peak of the Eastern District of Texas, which kind of had its own mystique. Um, this is years before NPR um, followed up on one of my sources and did its great story about um, the Eastern District of Texas and patent trolling called When Patents Attack. Um, and so I think that even people who didn't, you know, weren't like entrepreneurs or the owners of companies, I think even sort of on the line technology workers knew that this was happening and they were pissed about it because it affected their lives. They would hear about their colleagues getting dragged into depositions. They knew that the company was spending millions of dollars on legal expenses that otherwise could have gone to raises or to new projects. So it wasn't, you know, and I ran stories about the studies of how many billions of dollars, for example, um, the patent trolling industry had really taken out of the US economy. But those stories weren't that popular. I was writing for a group of people that kind of knew that was happening on a visceral level and were mad about it. Um, and I'll just mention one more thing from early 2013, which was, I also did a story about this uh, scan to email patent. That was, um, that, that was a, a non-practicing entity that really took a strategy of having a very widespread demand letter campaign that went after even the smallest businesses like 10 and under employees for basic business practices, um, like the innovation of like skip, putting a, um, turning an email into a, a PDF. Um, and, you know, kind of, I'll just add, it goes without saying, but it needs to be said, like there was no evidence that the inventor or holder of this patent had anything serious to do with the development of that technology, but they did own patents around it. Um, and this one got a lot of attention because I think it was, I think it was an outlier, even among, even in a world where patent um, assertions had gotten quite extreme. This was an outlier that got people's attention, and it also got lawmaker attention, in part, frankly, because he went after businesses in, in small states. Like, um, the senators in Nebraska and Iowa uh, have much fewer constituents than senators in California and New York, and lawmakers in some of those states, when people with small businesses um, call them up and tell them about these demands that they consider highly illegitimate, they get lawmakers' attention. Um, and then this also happened quite importantly uh, with Senator Leahy in Vermont, because Vermont businesses definitely, including some nonprofits, um, were hit by this scan to email uh, patent. And 
it became the subject of a few congressional hearings. And that reporting was also mentioned in um, Obama's uh, White House report on patents. Yeah, so, you know, I think that that's just such a fantastic story because it kind of shows this connection between, you know, the lawyers who are bringing these stories to you and the advocates who are bringing these stories to you. And then, you know, the, the, the folks in the media who are writing these stories up into compelling pieces that will, you know, get people's attention. Um, and then the policymakers who realize, you know, from this sort of reporting that, you know, there are problems here. Um, and we need to actually try to address them through policy. And, you know, I think that a lot of the work that you did really did end up uh, moving policy. I guess, you know, may, maybe one, one thing is um, kind of what lessons do you draw now that you moved into the advocacy world um, about how to kind of use media um, and how to, you know, work with, uh, work with reporters to, to bring these sorts of issues to the, uh, to the forefront. Um, you know, what sorts, of, what sorts of techniques have worked? What sorts of stories are effective? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, now that I've moved into the advocacy world, you know, I think the power of storytelling is it, it hasn't lessened my opinion of it at all. I think it's extremely important in how policy is made, how policy has changed. Um, and working at EFF has been really eye opening because EFF is um, constructed around this kind of foundational principle of, and, you know, in the nonprofit world, people talk a lot about what's your theory of change, right? Okay. So in, in at EFF, EFF is a law firm. Legally, that's what it's constructed as. And so that affects how I do my work quite a bit, actually. That affects my workflow a lot um, because all the activism I do is in the context of always remembering that I'm working for a law firm. People need to be clear on whether they're getting legal advice or not, which the people who are talking to me are not getting. Um, and so the EFF is based on this idea, there's like three you know, pillars of how we approach change, which is activism, law, and technology. So all three work together and um, which can be a complicated discussion at times, but it's also, you know, at the end, I think it's positive because we do have these conversations about how, what, you know, what is the right strategy here? And we do think about, um, and we kind of, we try to use everything but um, it, it's not like we, you know, we, we could make an argument that a law, we have litigators who could make an argument that a recently passed law, for example, is unconstitutional, needs to be changed, needs to be overturned. But then we also have an activism arm that can reach out to everyday people who care about the issue and get thousands of emails sent, right? Um, get thousands of calls made. Um, and, that's really important as well. I mean, I've, um, yeah, I guess I could, you know, I, I, it's interesting as I think, you know, overall, in terms of the number of people who, who read my work now as an advocate, it's much lower than when I was in the mainstream media, especially a popular tech website like Ars Technica has millions of viewers every month. You know, EFF blogs, they do get the occasional viral hit for sure. And that's very exciting and impactful. Um, but a lot of them don't. But I would say, if anything, I kind of feel the, Im the impact we have more at EFF because, and I don't totally know why that is. I think I might <laughs> spend more time figuring that out. But I think it's, um, it's obvious, for example, when, you know, um, policymakers and lawmakers call us and they're um, like, if we write something that's opposed to them, they'll be upset. I mean, like our blogs have a real effect on what they can do, whether they feel they can move forward or not. Um, and when you, when EFF gets the occasional, you know, hit, um, it can, it, it impacts the conversation in a way that you can very obviously tell. And I'll use the example of, um, you know, the Earn It campaign, a non-patent campaign that I ran last year that we thought would be a threat to encryption, also a threat to free speech. This was a law that was proposed, will probably be proposed again um, next year. Our, uh, one of our campaigns on that got well into the, you know, kind of hundreds of thousands of um, views and actions taken. And you could tell, I mean, it would, because it spread out to other media sites, it spread out to social media like Reddit, um, and, you know, it, it's hard to identify the kind of path, how this happens, but I, I was able to tell in that instance that our, our advocacy had um, some real impact. 
Now, what's that like in the patent space? Um, harder to tell. It's not, um, but you know, it's interesting. Like sometimes we've written stuff about um, patent policy issues that seem like they should be pretty obscure. <laughs> like you wonder who's going to read them outside of sort of lawyers and law students who are really interested in the space already, but they'll get, you know, they'll, by, by EFF standards, they'll become very popular posts. Like they'll get tens of thousands of reads sometimes. Um, and when we did things like we, we ran an action where we asked people to submit comments, public comments to the patent office. So that was the kind of rare action where we were able to see the results because they became public documents. And I think we had, you know, like more than um, 1500 comments sent, which is certainly a different number than the patent office is used to dealing with. That was the first time we'd done an action of that type. Um, and we don't want to kind of pull that lever every month or even every year. Um, but yeah, and Charles just put a link up to that action in the channel, um, chat channel. But um, that that's an example of how we have impact. And it's also what differentiates us from other advocates, right? Like EFF, one of the reasons I love working there, and there's a lot of nonprofits I think I, I wouldn't love working at, and I wouldn't feel comfortable as an externalist, but I feel very comfortable at EFF because, um, you know, it really is member supported. I mean, so we have, the money comes from members. Some people certainly give more than others. Um, and, but we have that, you know, what, when we say like we have like 30,000 people that pay us, I mean, that's, that's a real thing. And a lot of those people will take action. And so we, I am able to do my work thinking with an eye towards what is in the interest of those users you know, of those supporters. And um, I think that's something that unique that EFF brings to the table. And sometimes we have to show it, like by taking these actions and filing 1500 comments, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that, you know, just the ability to run that sort of campaign is just, it, it's, it's a really amazing opportunity that you have. And also just a really interesting way of sort of trying to influence policy that in, in a space that typically has not seen that sort of activity where you don't have, you know, thousands of people who are, who are weighing in on these sorts of, you know, potentially yeah. very technical, like very technical issues. Um, I just want to invite um, any of the folks to, uh, to ask questions. I see that Amanda, you've got your hand raised. Uh, did you want to go ahead um, and, and ask your question? Yeah, um, thank you for coming. Um, I actually read one of your pieces in the course of my day job um, about Tillis's patent eligibility bill. Um, on Monday, I know um, um, the Supreme Court asked the Solicitor General to weigh in on a patent eligibility case. And um, also the request for comment from the PTO closed over the weekend. What do you think is like the best vehicle? Obviously, I know you don't think it's the, the bill, but do you think the courts or the PTO is the best vehicle in this case specifically that's going to, that might go to the Supreme Court um, is the best vehicle for um, clarifying some of the, I guess, confusion right now when it comes to eligibility problems yeah yeah um i mean i think eff's position on that is just that i think that i think the confusion has been overstated and i think the mayo alice framework has been has has worked pretty well and i would say that you know we're kind of we're not even 10 years into the alice framework um so uh i think it's it's something that we kind of want to give more of a try. I mean, if you, so um, Charles, I gave you the link, I think of our Saving Alice project. I mean, I would say from EFS point of view, you know, there were two, there were two important reforms that came around 2014, right? One was the Alice decision and the other was through the America Invents Act was IPR. And I think at the time I was in journalism and EFF lawyers were my sources, not my, not my coworkers. Um, but I would say that we knew that Alice was going to be a good thing and IPR worked, I think, surprisingly well, actually better than people thought it would. Um, and now I think we're in a situation where the, you know, I, to be honest, we are fighting kind of a defensive battle here. 
which is its own um, strategic complication as EFF. But I think there's room for things to get better. But um, realistically, I'm not that sure that the politics are there. So from our point of view, opening up 101 um, to change is almost surely going to result in a backslide. I mean, my point of view, when, when I see statistics like, you know, 27 out of like 30, I'm kind of making up the number, but there was an article in IP Watchdog somewhat recently um, that didn't even include the, the um, some of the, I forget the term, the, the one line, uh, up, the non-presidential opinions maybe is what I'm thinking of that have up, upheld patent validation. Yeah. yeah. But we're seeing, so when we're seeing like 90% of software patents get invalidated at that level, from our point of view, that's not because of lack of clarity. That's because those patents were bogus. Like when you talk to actual technologists, that's what you hear. And the, the question from them is like, why isn't it a hundred percent? The fact is we're just, you know, I, I think we're at a point in history where it's, it is not clear the value to innovation, to the economy, the software patents bring at all. Um, and so what we'd like to see is like moving forward is like a study of that, that raises that question in an economic sense of are these supporting, you know, the values that the patent system is supposed to uphold at all. Um, which is, you know, and again, like um, maybe might be worth talking about how EFF got into patents for a second, but, you know, in a way we have, we have a bit of a different interest than, um, than lawyers who work with patents, frankly. Um, we came into patents, we EFF, okay, around 2003, 2004, when what was happening were, um, the web was in a much more young state. And there were get people were getting patents on things like online games, and they would send demand letters to sort of people who had small websites um, or very small companies, sort of projects that didn't even bring in one person's income. And EFF realized that not only was this going to be an economic problem, which now, I think that's now how people view it, is like, what is this doing to innovation? How do we get the right amounts of money to R and D, et cetera? But I think EFF saw in 2003, 2004 that this was going to be a free speech problem. And it is. I mean, that's where it's arrived. It actually affects your right to express yourself online. So from our point of view, um, Alice is doing as good a job as we could hope. I, I wish we could restructure 101 in a way that um, could be even better. But I think the odds of that are absolutely de minimis because before the pandemic, I was, I was in DC sometimes and you know I saw these round tables and it's like 100% industry lobbyists. There's almost no one there speaking up for the public interest. I mean, EFF has two lobbyists. They're both based in the Bay Area. So there's some, they're often in DC, but they're not based there. Um, I would love for us to get third lobbyists or fourth lobbyists. Um, uh, but yeah, I just think that it's a, it's a space where right now the, the public interest voice is um, pretty minimal. And so we rely on, we certainly have partners who were allied with uh, like Abby Rivas from Engine, who I see on this, is on this call. Engine has done great work in this space. And I would say, um, Unlike some other spaces EFF works in, such as you know privacy, um, there we tend to be we tend to end up on the same side of this issue as some large software companies, um, which is not true of our other work. And so then you know you have to think about how to navigate that. Um, I might be going way beyond the scope of your question, so I'm sorry if this is, um, but but we do think of like what we have to bring in this space, right? And so it's like, I think, I don't wanna misquote, but I think I have heard some of the um, more reformist companies um, say things like that they're comfortable with the Alice Mayo framework, 
Um, but I think it's different when we from EFF say that, because when we say that, we're saying it because we hear from the little guys, guys being uh, guys and girls, all genders. Um, but we hear from the small entrepreneurs and those are the cases we take, those are the people we try to help. Um, so yeah, I, th I think there's a discussion for other positive um, reforms, but um, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm skeptical of the current um, process, the, certainly the legislative processes that would open up 101 to change um, don't look good. Mm -hmm. And I think the Tillis bill is a sign of that, right? I mean, the Tillis bill is the result of two plus years of chatting about this thing where they said in a press release that they heard from all the parties, but in fact, they heard from patent maximalists. And it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's kind of an amazingly um, extreme bill. So I, I think that that's an indication of certainly under the current Senate IP subcommittee. Um, well, I shouldn't say that because he's, he's not the chairman, but um, he's a high ranking member of the Senate IP subcommittee. And so I think we're, we're skeptical that that process would um, produce a good result. So I, I think there's really things we can... Mm -hmm. Oh, go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I, was... I mean, I, I just find it really interesting, you know, the, the sort of conversation about, you know, what's the role of the public interest organization, um, you know, kind of differentiating it from, um, you know, sort of the, the interests, particularly the corporate interests out there, you know, bringing in sort of these free speech questions that otherwise wouldn't get raised, bringing in, you know, some of the views of technologists that are your members. Um, and EFF is a really interestingly structured organization. Um, you've got folks who come from all of those different backgrounds, right? There are, there are lawyers, um, you know, who have JDs and will practice law in many cases. Um, you know, EFF um, is, is a leader in sort of public interest litigation in the digital space. Um, and then you've got folks who come from the advocacy community or who work on advocacy, many of whom aren't lawyers. Um, and then you also have technologists who um, actually work on, on these sorts of issues and consult. Um, yeah. You know, I think it would be it would be really interesting um, if you could talk just a little about how um, how all of those different folks interact um, and how they kind of work together to um, to, to advocate for the sorts of issues um, yeah. that you're talking about that your members are interested in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, when we publish things on EFF, um, not legal based, but when we publish blog posts and things like that. Um, anything written by an activist will go through a legal review and anything written by a non-activist, like a technologist or a lawyer, will go through an activism review. So, and the goals, you could, you could imagine what those might be, but I'll, I'll spell it out, is the goal of legal review is to make sure everything that we're saying is legally correct and is in line with our positions. Um, the goal of activism review is to kind of make sure, the way I view it is to make sure that it is going to be understood by those, the 30,000 people that give us part of their paycheck every year, the 500,000 people that are on our newsletters and give us a few minutes of their attention um, every month. Those are people are important too. Um, and I wanna make sure it's understood by them. The vast majority of them do not have JDs and do not have formal legal training. So that's kind of how we get it out there. Um, some of our posts are more complicated than others. You know, I think a, a question that the activists will ask of both the lawyers and the technologists is, okay, well, who's your audience here? Like, if you have a highly specialized audience in mind for this one, maybe you don't need to take all my advice about how to make this easier to understand. But usually, I mean, 90 plus percent of the time, the goal is to kind of maximize um, readership. And so, because again, like, at, at the end of the day, like we, you know, at EFF, it's a strong rule that you kind of show your work. We don't do that much work that we don't blog about. The, ex the obvious exceptions there are like um, legal advice and stuff, which a lot of the times is a, a, in, within an attorney-client relationship. Um, but in terms of the actual litigation we do, the lawyers always blog it. In terms of the work that's done on the non-legal teams, it gets blogged. And that's kind of part of an ethos of showing your work. Um, because, you know, as, a, as our executive director says, we work for tips. I mean, we have to make our, our supporters believe that we're making the internet a freer, 
more innovative and more just and fair place. And we have to do it every year. Um, so that's what, you know, that's why it's worth it for the lawyers to work with us. And of course, we also have to keep up that reputation um, with our supporters, but also with staffers and experts too. And that's what the legal team and the technologists help us do as well. So there's also stuff I write, like on the encryption side, for example, where we'll go through both a lawyer and a technologist um, after I write it. Um, and you'll so actually, I'll be there should be publishing an example of that within the next 24 hours, a post that's been reviewed by both our encryption lawyer and our, our cryptographer. Um, and that's why it's really cool to work at EFF. I, you know, in the nonprofit space, not everyone has those resources, I mean, to say the least. So some of the people who do kind of internet human rights advocacy um, are kind of blown away by the fact that I, I mean, in the encryption space, that would be a really good example. Like, I don't think I have other colleagues on this campaign who get to have their stuff reviewed by a really experienced um, lawyer who's worked on encryption and Fourth Amendment issues, and also a cryptographer, like former Googler, who really knows what, everything about what she's doing in the space. Um, yeah, I mean, that sounds like just such a, such a, such a great and educational experience. Um, and, you know, I think it, it, it really speaks to something that I learned kind of throughout my career that, you know, being a lawyer, um, you do still have to develop this really important skill of being able to explain things um, in non-lawyer terms to different audiences. Um, and, you know, I think that, that that kind of goes back to um, your, you know, the work that you did over at Ars Technica um, in which the ability to write and tell stories um, about these legal concepts is just so important to, to influencing policy, right? Well, I think what Charles, you wrote a great example of that for us. I think your piece about how Amazon got a patent on white background photography is one that I still send people to. And um, and that was also, I mean, yeah, our Technica got pitched by a lot of lawyers who wanted to publish stuff on our site. And it usually was just not um, things that were gonna work, but that, I mean, I, I think I was the editor on that. I barely edited it. Um, and it was, it was um, in terms of guest written material, it was incredibly popular piece. And it's one that I still use and refer people to. And I totally agree. And there's, I think, you know, um, for, for the people on this call who I think might be the majority who are either in the legal field or going to pursue that, um, you know, I think it's a great skill to hone if you wanna do some work in the public interest. I think there's kind of more opportunity to do that than ever. It can be, you can make it the focus of your career, you can make it part of your career. But I think part of that is, you know, writing and talking in, to laymen who care, you can do that through the media or now there's really opportunities to do that directly. Um, that is that can be a great way to make change. And I think in an increasingly specialized world, people like the, the people on this call who get into very specialized areas of knowledge, I think it's I think it's great to just make that effort. I see this in the health science too. I mean, I think now with so much coverage of COVID, it's like people are seeing that these relations, you don't as a journalist, you don't want to be going to the doctor, learning the things and establishing your relationship with the medical source at the moment of crisis. That is going to lead to substandard coverage. It's better to have a beat reporter who knows this stuff. And so as lawyers, I would kind of make the same pitch to you. You know, no one likes to see their field or their profession portrayed in like a, a simplistic or inaccurate way. And so I think it's worth the time if you have that kind of skill set and that interest um, as folks like, like Abby and Charles um, surely do, I think it's worthwhile to do those things. And I, the other thing I would mention about EFF is there's a lot of like overlap and like career switching, a, a lot, I think, relative to the rest of the world. But we currently have one person on our activism team, my supervisor actually, who she's has a JD, but she's not a practicing lawyer. She chose to go into writing instead. When I was at American Lawyer Media, there were a couple of writers there who had formal legal training. And I think at least one who had practiced and just decided that they would rather write about the law than, than litigate. Um, 
And those people have been great. We had another person on the activism team who also had a JV. And then it's also worked the other way around, right? So there's 10, there's probably, my last count was 10, but it might be actually 11 or 12 um, former journalists who work at EFF. So that's a pretty big contingent at an at a organization that's less than 90 people, right? We have our own um, chat channel of EFF ex-journalists and um, stuff like that. So that's, you know, that's like two, our two-person press team, both former journalists. Um, two of our lawyers actually are former journalists. And then you have a good, I think, um, probably four or five of us on the activism team are former journalists. And then we also have um, investigative, an investigative researcher or two now actually, who are both former journalists who work on kind of investigating on the technology side. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, I think that that's, that just goes to all the, the, the thought that there are so many different backgrounds that can be, that can be relevant um, to the sort of, the sort of activism world. Um, and, you know, that, that, that means that I think that a lot of people, a lot of people who might not think that, you know, they, they would naturally fit in this sort of space actually have a really important role to play. Um, in yeah, I think that's true. Sorts of issues. Um, you know, one of the things that you do have to deal a lot with are these very technical things, you know, like abbreviations like IPR, these sorts of documents, mm -hmm. case law that is, is, is not usually the easiest um, to write. And, you know, in, in so far as we're talking about, you know, kind of expressing these sorts of, um, um, these sorts of concepts to non-lawyers, what sorts of techniques do you use? Because I think a lot of those translate well to, to legal writing as well. You know, how do you, how do you teach these sorts of things to people? Um, who otherwise aren't immersed in patent law, who otherwise, you know, don't have that sort, yeah. of, that sort of legal background. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think IPR is a good, a pretty good example, actually, because it was this thing that became more important. It has, you know, a Latin name. So that's like alienating to people right away. It's like, the, I mean, speaking of Latin names, right? I mean, I, I joked about this I, and I've said it to the uh, well, I don't know if I said it to the founder, but I said it to like managers at Ars Technica. I was like, you know, the original sin of this place was to pick a Latin name. Like it's, it's like appeals to the, the nerdocracy that is the hardcore readers. But um, there's also like a couple million people that like we didn't get. And then we got new competitors uh, while I was working at Ars with names like The Verge, right? And so I was like, I think they scooped up a million people right away that were just kind of like alienated by um, a website with a Latin name. So I'm still thinking about that stuff, right? So IPR is a good example where it was like, well, we're asking people now to take action. For, for a while, we kind of ignored it. We were like, this is going to be a hard thing to explain to our supporters. And so like, let's kind of let the lawyers work on it. Um, but it got to a point where, well, we want our supporters like file comments in the patent office to say this system should keep working properly and it should work in the public interest. So we do have to explain it. And so, you know, it's like, well, we use the word review. We explain that it's a patent review, you know, that happens after the patent is granted and that it's really important. And then we link it to something that a lot of our supporters already know, which is that a lot of patents should never have been granted in the first place. And that the patent system is not a good and natural fit for software. Um, so, I mean, that's how we do it. And then I think, you know, there's, um, we also use repetition. I mean, that's a rhetorical tool. It's not like you write one thing one time and everyone gets it. Um, and I think especially you don't write one long thing one time and everyone gets it. Um, and that is, that is something that um, I will say that's part of the dynamic between activists and lawyers, right? Like, I think sometimes lawyers are wanting to you know, like, well, they will think about their blog, like the way they think about their, you know, motion to dismiss. It's like, I'm going to write this thing and it's, this is going to be it. This is like the final word. Um, but, you know, and so then we have to think about ways to introduce kind of sometimes uncomfortable truths about how human communication and politics work, which are like, well, this would be more effective if you, you know, maybe we should think about writing like a 700 word blog about this 
then follow it up with an email to supporters. Um, and maybe you should be blogging about it again, you know, three weeks from now in another 800 word blog, instead of writing one 4,000 word piece and just insisting that it's the authoritative version, you know, like, I don't disagree with you. I bet you can write the authoritative version. Um, but, um, I think a thing that you learn the hard way in journalism, um, which I think is good for the advocacy world. And I think it's a good lesson for anyone to learn, right? Is like, well, sometimes, you know, imagine you're catching up with a friend of yours. Like this is a good trick for like writing in journalism. If you can't think of a lead. Imagine you're catching up with a friend of yours who you haven't seen in a few years. And you have like 20 minutes to talk to them and about tell them everything about what's going on in your life. And one of the questions they ask you is, well, what are you working on at work? You know, you got to get, oh, you work at EFF, Joe. Like, what do you, you do something about patents? What's the thing you're doing right now? And say, say well, we're fighting, you know, a really bad bill that would make it easier for, um, much easier for bad patents to get in the system and be used to threaten people. I mean, think about what, because in this conversation, you're going to go on to talk about your family life or your dating life or your, you know, like your vacation and all the other things that are part of life. So um, EFF.org as a, as a publishing system should have those authoritative pieces, but then we also are going to make newsletters and we're also are going to have respect and like love <laughs> for the person who has, you know, they have like, five minutes of their day to think about free speech on the internet. Um, and then they got to go back to the other stuff they're doing. They got to pick up their kids um, from school. They have to like make dinner. Um, they have to maintain their relationships and keep their jobs. And, um, and that's part of how it works. And so it, it's affected a lot how I think about communication and, and advocacy. I think that's just a really fantastic lesson. I, I hadn't heard that, that, that writing trick before, the one about thinking about, you know, catching up with a friend for, for 20 minutes. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think that that's a really effective technique. And plus talking about, you know, repetition, um, the idea that you can take some of your work and put it into multiple forms, um, you know, shorter, longer ones that, you know, might attract different audiences and hopefully end up kind of getting yeah. the word out. Yeah. I that that's, and I mean, in some ways, like repetition is not really the fun part of the job, right? I think for, for lawyers or for advocates or for journalists, it's like you want to, um, I don't know, move on to the next thing. But there is some, there is just some strategic value in it, right? Um, and so that's, that's why it's a job. Like we get paid to do it, right? Like I'm going to be, I publish the blog post, I publish the follow up, I write the Twitter messages, I put the same messages onto Facebook. Um, you go to where the people are at. I mean, we will, and we criticize Facebook and Twitter for all kinds of things, including content moderation policies and stuff like that. But um, we also use them, right? Like we, the activism team's job is like, you know, there's always, um, I won't say there's always, sometimes there are thoughts of like, you know, well, maybe we'll just like walk away from this system that we have some ideological objections to, um, but, you know, we have to use the communication. The activism team definitely at EFF is always there to remind me, well, we have to communicate to people where they're at, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, so we've got uh, just a couple of more, a couple more minutes. Um, if any of you have additional questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, but let me, let me pose this to you. Um, so EFF sounds like a fantastic place to work. Um, how do I get a job there? <laughs> um, it is a great place to work. Uh, there's a, like, hmm, how do you get a job there? I think the way to get a job at EFF, uh, well, there's very different routes in to the three different um, program teams. Um, I think if you're interested in becoming a lawyer at EFF, uh, it's to, that's a, it's an active, you know, we do activist impact litigation. So the answer there is to become a litigator and get experience as a litigator um, and try to do the kind of work that will bring you into the areas of law that we work on, like Fourth Amendment, um, you know, right to privacy and IP litigation. Um, 
And I don't know that I have better advice than that because I'm not on the legal team. Um, but I mean, yeah, the way to become an activist litigator working in the public interest is to litigate. And the way to become an activist writer who's advocating for the public interest is to write. And I think in the second regard, I think there's kind of more avenues than there have ever been. Um, and, and I would say at EFF, the second point is important, even if you want the first job, <laughs> right? So like you, it's that show your work thing, right? It's like, I think what they really want are people who could be a great litigator and then also, you know, show up to the EFF speakeasy um, where there'll be 35 of our supporters, uh, you know, maybe more, but uh, the, the numbers, it's, it's, it's going to be our first speakeasy next week since the, since the pandemic. So we'll see how many people show up. Um, Last time but, it was hundreds. <laughs> yeah, I know. We used to really have these like packed events in San Francisco and I'd love to see those numbers again, but I'm, we'll, we'll see. I, I plan to be there next week in San Francisco. Um, and like, so who could stand up and kind of say like, well, what is the work we're doing on section 230 um, and explain it in sort of a short uh, format and, and kind of want to explain it to people who might not know about it, but who really care. Um, so I think, yeah, having that ability to, um, explain why your work is in the public interest is really important. And that's a skill, if you, if you ultimately want to work in public interest, I think that's a skill you could develop at even the earliest points in your career. Because, and Charles, you would know this, I think better than me, but the, the impression I get from friends that have gone just through law firms in their career path is like, that isn't necessarily a thing that happens naturally. You have to go get it, right? I mean, there's going to be plenty, you'll have plenty of clients who just want you to win their case and or get them as good a result as possible. Um, and so think about that. How can you develop that writing in the public interest thing? And it's a little different style than the kind of like some of the expert writing that I've seen in the Daily Journal and other legal trade publications where the really po the point of the lawyer's writing is, I assure you, I am an expert on this. And here is like an interesting tweak in the law or a thought I have about what the law might mean. You know, see if you can write something that is more, you know, taking more of a stance than that or saying who are the winners and losers here. Um, I think that's a skill that I'm still working on, you know, we're uh, Sharon, you have a question. Hello. Yeah. yeah, it's very nice to hear about all the things what you are talking about exactly, sure. um, especially the way of communicating um, the issues and how you put it up in your writing. So when my question is a small one regarding when you put up a question or the issue in which you feel it is something disturbing in public interest. Um, so what would what, what, what do you prefer? Like something um, giving a problem with a solution, a suggestion of solution, or you like to keep the question open to people, think about it. What is the your favorite way of communicating? I mean, this, I think both ways are there, but I would like to know your favorite one. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. So I think the the question of, you know, what are you that that's a that's a good question, and it has changed um, over my career, right? So now I'm working for an advocacy organization where a lot of the times we do end or begin with a definitive point of view. And so some of our posts are, this is our view on how it should be. This law should be withdrawn. Some of them that are made by the activism team go to the next step where it says, take action. So we have software tools that will allow you to, um, to email your congressperson or things like that very easily. So that is a lot of the writing I do now. It is like kind of what is EFF's view on this and I'm communicating that. And um, sometimes, right, some, the, then there's like, you're, there might be places where we haven't quite finished developing our view. And so it's like, you might skip over that or think how you can write around that. Um, or there might even be internal disagreement or disagreement with a partner organization. 
But usually, a lot of times, I, I'm not trying to be uh, sound conceited here or anything, but a lot of times those are like invisible to our readers because some of these internal debates are like so in the weeds that it's you have to really be in the weeds to, to care. 99% of our folks don't. But it's different than what I, I would say I've transitioned to that from having written, like when I wrote for the AP, you kind of really try to just write in a straightforward way and always express both or all sides of the story. Um, and same in the legal press. I mean, you know, uh, so which do I like better? Um, you know, there are things I liked about um, the style of writing at Ars Technica. I would say in Ars Technica, I actually kind of pushed for what I will say is sort of my own style, which I called it advocacy-ish journalism. It wasn't quite like hardcore activism, activist journalism of the kind I had seen, like at my first journalism internship, which was at the SF Bay Guardian, a very kind of vocally activist free weekly. Um, but my feeling at ours was that we should develop a voice on some of these issues that's like advocacy-ish. And what I mean by that is, we always ask the other side for their point of view, and we'll always talk to them. And I, I will say, I kind of miss that because at EFF, a lot of the times we don't do that. I mean, if we're criticizing someone's litigation or filing, we might reach out to them, but we do it in a very kind of careful, formal way. Um, and if it's, if it's a litigation matter, it's probably written by a lawyer, not by me, and it goes through those channels. Um, but at ours, I did like how we, um, you know, like when we would write about sort of abuses of IP law, um, we would, I would do it in a way that I always went and got the other side's point of view or tried to if they would talk. Um, but I also didn't write in a way that I pretended that everything was fairsies or that um, we viewed these sides equally, you know, um, because I felt like I was writing for a group of of people that kind of knew knew what the game is, um, but yeah, I guess the the answer of like which I like better are um, I don't know. It depends on the it depends on the day. Some days I'm glad I'm um, uh, writing advocacy work and. I, I will say in some ways, I think writing advocacy work is a bit, it can be a bit easier in some ways. It's, it's kind of simpler. I mean, um, to the extent that there are, you know, shades of gray in some of the EFF work, you, you kind of iron it out of the final product, actually. Um, that's part of the back and forth. Um, so yeah, it's, some ways it's a little easier. Thank you. Sure. Um, so, so yeah, you know, it's, um, you know, there, there's lots of really interesting um, questions about sort of writing style. Um, so, you know, we, we started at um, Fuzzlefy, so why don't we go for, for another two minutes. Um, so Amanda, you've got a question in the chat about Intel's, yeah. um, about Intel's patent portfolio. So just to uh, sort of get to, um, to, to, um, to the next panel, um, so we'll have our next session next week, same time um, on, I think it'll be what, the 25th, uh, 25th, uh, 26th. Um, that'll be with Josh Landau, um, who is generally an expert in sort of what's going on in the corporate patent world. But Joe, if you wanted to say a couple of words um, about about that topic, um, you know, feel free to to um, to say something. Yeah. So uh, this is about Amanda's question in the chat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the question is, what do you think of Intel's decision to sell off a large chunk of their portfolio to an MPE, and how do you think it will affect Intel's role in the uh, patent advocacy space? Um, so I will confess that I just Googled who they sold it to. <laughs> um, so yeah, IP value, yeah. Um, you know, I think it's problematic. And I think that um, it, it actually is problematic enough that it is it is something that uh, EFF has specifically advocated against. And I'll tell you the format in which we did that, 
we had some years ago, this was before I came on a project that I'll be quite honest, it didn't really go anywhere. I wish it had taken off a bit more, but we had a project where we were trying to do something that should have been easier, which is to convince um, public universities in particular to not sell their patents to patent trolls, because we felt like we could make an argument to them that they should really be serving the public and that this was a disservice to the public. Um, and, you know, I mean, both private and public universities get a lot of government funding. So I think the university community, especially, you know, the specialized kind of tech transfer offices that universities have now, um, I think those were kind of our go-to when we were started saying, you know, you need to think about the public interest in a patent transaction. And I thought we had a little more ground to stand on talking to universities than talking to Intel. Because um, at the end of the day, they're a private company and this stuff is perfectly legal. Um, but I don't think it's helpful. Um, that's probably a question that I should think about doing, do a little more thinking about. Uh, what should EFF say about um, an act like that where you know, it's a known thing, what's going to happen with those patents? Um, and so I, you know, I've heard both at, at different events, different, there have been different kinds of, um, I'll say schemes over the year of, although I, I don't mean that in a net pejorative sense, but ideas about how we could limit this chain of commerce that patents go through, like there would be a license on transfer or something like that. And I think some of those ideas are good, but they have not gotten us out of this problem. And I don't think there's going to be some kind of magic licensing system or that um, that will get us out of situations like what happened with Intel. I do think it will affect their patent advocacy. I mean, Intel, it, you know, and partly like to, to be quite frank about it, because people like me will kind of make sure it does. Um, I thought, I think Intel was actually invited recently to um, one of the sessions that was run by uh, Patrick Leahy, where they were talking about the problem of NPEs. And I thought they gave some great testimony. So that kind of raises the question of how does this, uh, how does this action comport with what they were saying on Capitol Hill? So I think it's problematic, but I'm also being frank with you about uh, where we're at in terms of advocacy, which is we tried to convince people that should have a social conscience about this kind of thing to not do it. And we haven't been successful. So we need to keep working on it. I also think that um, the, and this is where EFF has a role to play. This is not something we've developed, but it's, we need to work on it. Um, sometimes tech workers, will speak up about the bad things their company is doing. And tech workers are like the core of us, not the people who have, they're not necessarily our biggest donors, but I think about the people who take, but in aggregate they are, right? So I think about the people who take a hundred bucks a year out of their paycheck or a thousand bucks a year out of their paycheck and hand us money. A lot of those people do work for tech companies. Um, a lot of Ars Technica readers work for tech companies. So I would like them to speak up and it doesn't always happen. That's hard to do. People gotta make a living and move on with their lives. But um, it's a great question. I think we've only started to answer it. So um, it, it's the kind of thing that EFF needs to play more of a role in. Um, and it was Paul Com at the hearing, it wasn't Intel. Um, I think you're referring to the PTAB hearing that happened in um, June, July. Um, is that the hearing that you were talking about that Senator Leahy did? Uh, it might have been. Um, it might have been an older hearing. It was maybe it was the hearing on pride and patent ownership, the transparency. Oh, okay. Hearing, which was actually a while ago. 
Um, so I hate to cut off this conversation because this is just really fantastic discussion. Um, we so we will um, have our we will have our session next week. Um, it's been delightful um, talking with all of you, and you know, feel free to reach out to either Joe or me if you want to talk more about um, about these topics. Um, this is you know this has been really great. I, um, so thank you, Joe, for taking the time to talk with everybody. Sure thing. I enjoyed it. And I just put my very easy to remember email in the channel. It's joe at eff.org.